second panel session, we'll be going to deliver a topic of harnessing digital innovation for financial inclusion for SMEs. Integration of all social classes and businesses in mainstream financial system is crucial in sustaining growth in the digital economy. This can be achieved through utilizing technology-based financial services with the support of new technologies like artificial intelligence, big data, blockchain, and the rapid expansion of the mobile payment and as well for digital banking. These technologies are becoming increasingly linked and inter interconnected, placing fintech and financial industry innovation on fast track while shaping the financial industry competitiveness landscape. And as well, these technologies can be better address consumer and business demand and pre preferences, ensuring enhanced availability, accessibility, usage, and convenience, which boosts financial inclusion. Now, let me introduce our first panelist, Mr. Nason Munasami. Nason Munasami is a brilliant venture capitalist and entrepreneur. He is predominantly known as the co-founder of Money Match, a, a multinational financial technology firm focusing on international payment. Money Match has also recently received a digital currency license. He is also managing partner for TH Capital, a Malaysian-based private investment firm with strong Southeast Asian connection. Next, our second panelist will be Mr. Paul Liang Chi Pong. Mr. Paul is currently direct, Director of Retail Enterprise Distribution and the Head of SME Sales Development, CIMB Bank Berhad. He has been involved in CIMB Foundation activities such as CIMB Shine Program to bridge the gap and moving into digital transformation. CIMB Foundation is a platform for startup entrepreneurs and SMEs to equip them with the right knowledge in finance industry, in industry revolution 4.0, and also e-commerce. Moving forward, we have Mr. Giazuddin Ali Muhammad as the third uh, panelist for our second session. Giaz is Senior Policy Manager for Digital Financial Services, DFS, at Alliance for Financial Inclusion, AFI. He leads digital financial services and fintech policy works at AFI, which entails providing peer learning, technical assistance, and advisory services to central banks on leveraging digital finance and fintech to advance financial inclusion. He has more than 14 years of work experience in DFS and financial inclusion advisory services. He worked in various projects with regulator, government institu institution, banks, mobile network, and also MFIs across the globe. Coming up next, we have Dr. Numazila Dato Mazdan as the final panelist of the second session. Dr. Numazila is an independent non-executive director for BIMB Securities, Sindrian Berhad. She was formerly the chief executive officer of Malaysian Institution of Accountant, MIA. She is also a certified internal auditor and holds a certified risk management and assurance qualification. She holds a PhD in accounting from University of Birmingham, United Kingdom. Last but not least, I would like to introduce our moderator, Mr. Jonathan Dyson. Having a tri-sector experience in the corporates, NGO and government sectors, Jonathan believes that the digital divide will need to be addressed through a multi-stakeholder approach for us to progress in advanced nation. He is currently an incoming Squashman Scholar, which is one of the most prestigious and competitive international postgraduate awards in the world, which will he will be pursuing master at Tsinghua University, China. So welcome everyone to the second panelists and speakers and also our moderator, please. All right, once again, everyone, I would like to remind the audience that this is an hour long panel session and there will be a Q&A session afterwards. To virtual participant, if you do have any question to ask, please don't hesitate to drop a question in the Zoom chat. For all physical attendees, you will be given a chance to ask a question by raising your hand and our usher will be assist you to the nearest mic. All right, now without further ado, um, I would like to pass the mic to Mr. Jonathan to kickstart our panel session of the day. Right, there's my bank. Uh, you hold. Test. All right. Okay. Great. 
Then she's yours. Thank you very much to our MC. Um, welcome back from lunch, everyone. I hope that everybody had a good lunch. Um, hello to everyone that's joining um, us online as well. Um, you are included. Um, later, there will be a Q&A session. So just leave your questions um, in the chat box and we will, um, we will try to pick them out on there. Um, thank you to all our amazing speakers today. So when the topic was first given to me, um, harnessing digital innovation for financial inclusion, it included two very big scopes. Uh, one, we want to talk about the B40, which is generally the underserved in our country. And the second group is the SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. So these are, although they are related, they are actually two um, different scopes altogether. So today's conversation will sort of oscillate between B40 and SMEs. And that's how we would um, arrange our conversation. But really, um, we'll start by first coloring in what it means for each of this group. And then finally, when we actually close our conversation, we want to move towards action. What can you do as an audience to help either contribute um, to making things better? Or maybe if you are in the B40 or you are running your own business and SME, what can you do to help yourself move forward? So I'll just like to open up with the first question here would be, and this will cover the theme of the B40. So who are these individuals? How have they been impacted by the wave of digitalization? What are the gaps and who is being left behind? Perhaps we can start with um, Mr. Giaz. Jonathan, am I audible? Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. And uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, my name is Giaz. I work for Alliance for Financial Inclusion. We are like an association of central banks working towards financial inclusion uh, policies. I think at the, at the outset, uh, uh, we should commend the, the, the financial inclusion initiatives uh, in, in Malaysia, if we speak relatively. Uh, and look at the global uh, financial inclusion rates. Um, the work done by World Bank suggests that uh, Malaysia stands at about 90% financial inclusion rate, um, uh, which, which talks about uh, ownership of uh, any account, a formal account for adults beyond uh, 15 plus one, uh, 15 and above. So relatively, we are doing good because as we compare at a global average, it's about 70 to 75%. But if you look at uh, the excluded uh, or disadvantaged uh, sections, uh, I think uh, there'll be three, four uh, kind of um, uh, groups here. First is uh, women. So globally, I think um, in terms of account ownership, the gender gap has reduced from 9% to 6%. So while 76% um, is the um, average global average for financial inclusion, women hold lesser, on an average, uh, lesser women hold an account, a formal account with a financial institution. While luckily that's not the case in Malaysia, there's a parity when, it, when we see um, ownership of accounts between um, men and women in, in Malaysia. Um, and, uh, but if we go beyond access, beyond just owning an account, uh, to looking at, um, value added financial services like savings, uh, borrowing, so on and so forth. That's where there is a gender gap. So for example, if you look at borrowing, uh, so there is a gender gap of about eight to 9%. So eight to 9% lower uh, women um, who have borrowed from a formal financial institution as compared to men, right? This holds the case even for digital payments. And that's relevant to the discussion that we are having today. Um, relatively lesser number of women, uh, and the gap is around seven to eight uh, percent, have used digital payments online as compared to men. Uh, if you look at the latest uh, uh, data, and beyond women, uh, I think uh, the other disadvantaged groups. Uh, again, if you look at our uh, rural poor vis-a-vis -vis the urban um, poor or the urban uh, population. Uh, and the other kind of disadvantaged group is the elderly. And this again pertains to the discussion that we've been having, we are having on digital actually. So the, uh, the 
usage, the ownership usage um, and familiarity of digital devices is relatively lesser amongst the, the elderly. So as a result, the financial inclusion rates, digital payment rates are lesser, right? And beyond these, uh, we also uh, kind of look at uh, uh, segments like uh, uh, in terms of income, in terms of um, labor force participation, in terms of uh, uh, education. So there's a vast difference in terms of uh, uh, account ownership as well as digital payments when we look at um, adults with uh, uh, no education, primary education and secondary education, actually. I, I think this kind of has a, a, a direct effect in terms of per capita income and then, you know, labor, labor force participation, so on and so forth. But, you know, it starts with education, actually. Um, so these are the various kind of disadvantaged uh, seg segments. And this seems to be more pronounced when it comes to uh, using digital devices, making digital payments and accessing value added financial services through uh, digital channels. So I'll take a pause here. Happy to take any follow ups or any specific uh, ropes that you have, uh, Jonathan. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Mr. Gia. So we know that the gaps are in gender, urban rural divide, um, age, and also level of education. Uh, but I'd like to turn your attention to Dr. Noor. Yeah, do you have anything to add, especially from the Malaysian perspective or the work that you have done so far? Right. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. And it's really, I'm really pleased to see all of you. Uh, you know, everyone looks refreshed after the lunch. Uh, I think you have a lot more energy to ask questions. We're really looking forward to the questions. So I think throughout my 30 years of career, I've worked with many people at various uh, different backgrounds and as well at different sectors. So I started my career as an auditor. Then I worked uh, as a accountant in a public listed company actually is a cooperative that turned out to be a uh, public listed uh, KUB Malaysia Berhad where the shareholders are about 178,000 people yeah so it's really very interesting to see how the cooperative turned into public listed with a different culture that they have to adapt and then I work in University of Malaya I really actually at that time would like to reach out to the young so I work in UM then after that uh, I work in Malaysia Institute of Accountant for almost seven years and I was very much uh, you know involved in ASEAN I do travel a lot to Laos and Vietnam, and I work also with uh, global uh, friends like in Africa. I work with uh, a lot of initiative to enhance literacy among people. Yeah. So, but uh, this is where I think the points that Gias brought about um, education is really, really very important. And when when we talk about inclusion apart from the data that we have, what we call recorded data, even I think in the financial sector, we also have uh, what we call informal banking. So the data that we have is called, is collated from formal banking, but it's a lot of informal banking. So uh, accessibility is very important and usage. So when we talk about women and uh, probably the underserved, uh, they probably have their own way of uh, banking. Yeah. So just to share with you, this gives you a bit of perspective. I spoke to um, my previous boss, uh, Tan Sri Sama, and we were talking about uh, during the pandemic, the, the sale of gold, yeah, the jewelry, is really has gone up. And people are selling gold through Telegram to WhatsApp. You know, and they purchase gold and it's really, they really purchase gold at that time. And, and that, I'd like to bring you this story in Kelantan. And there's one Pasar Khadija in Kelantan. So what they did is that in the morning, the traders will go and pawn their gold and get some more money. And they use that to start their trade for that day. And at the end of the day, they will go and take back their gold and pay their debt. So this is a very interesting way how the different sector of the economy are financing their business. And it is still there. You know, the, if you can go and look at the gold prices in Malaysia has also gone up. 
So when we talk about inclusion, we have to be mindful of the informal sector as well. Yeah, and and thankfully with the pandemic, uh, there's more effort to uh, by the government in getting people to have phones and accessibility. So we have uh, you know jaringan uh, where they gave about uh, to I think eight point five million people free handphones, and then there's a e wallet connectivity uh, uh, from the budget from MOF and more and more people have phones and you know among the women you know the usage of of uh, of the phone they really harness when you talk about the word harness they really use it you know so they sell Tupperwares through the WhatsApp a lot of sale has taken place because of the opportunity to reach out and this may not, the data, I think, I'm not sure how far those data is collected in terms of the trade uh, that has gone, uh, you know, within the informal kind of platform. So they just use Telegram and they then just say book, 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 and they send the money through the banking transactions and they post the gold ring or the gold pendant they send it through post, normal post. You'll be amazed it is happening because I'm, I'm that kind of age of woman and I'm among them, you know. And I accidentally, you know, I accidentally was included in their telegram and I saw the volume of the message for the day is like hundreds and then I started looking at what it's all about. So this is about inclusion. So education is important. We heard from uh, Dato Yasmin this morning about the potential risks. So uh, this is where I think this is our role to also educate them uh, in terms of the risks uh, with digital and the risk of using, I think, uh, digital transaction. So, and this is just one sector that you mentioned women, but uh, we have another sector you know those students and they get the free, free gadgets as well so how then within this scenario of uh, the role of the education to uh, bring them to the right way to harness the word harness i think is very beautiful to harness technology so that's from another perspective Thank you very much for that insight. Um, since this program is recorded, I'm not sure if Bank Nagara needs to needs to monitor and regulate um, WhatsApp and Telegram groups now. <laughs> but speaking about business, um, let's turn the attention to SMEs, right? So um, it's not just the B40 that has suffered over the last two years. SMEs as well. Many SMEs have had to completely change their business model simply because you couldn't go out. You had to do things online. And what if you are in one of those groups that have been left out, as what uh, Gias has pointed out? You're an older individual. You don't really know how to open your own Shopee account and you cannot do business as per usual. What do you then do? So perhaps I'd like to start with Paul, then we'll go to Nathan. Paul, how, how has SMEs fared? All right. Um, first of all, um, it's a bit too loud here. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, uh, thanks the, uh, for having me and us and uh, the uh, committee uh, for organizing this tirelessly, and of course the moderator and it's a great pleasure uh, to stay here with all of you the young and brilliant smart minds uh, the future leaders i like to borrow these words from uh, Tato Yazin. Um, yeah some uh, you see i would like to borrow these two words chinese words because i uh, i was chinese at um weiji danger and opportunity. When there are dangers, there are changes uh, in lifestyle, in the economy, then there come the opportunities. So then I'm a very practical person because uh, banking is about, you know, taking deposits and lending. Uh, but from experience, through experience from what I've seen in the last couple of years, some managed to do more, quite a number of those, and some, um, you know, just manage to barely survive and some will have to live on uh, uh, you know those special fundings or assistance by Bank Negara or whatever financial sources they can get. Uh, just take a number. Um, you see from touch and go, open source, the data, 
uh, some managed to, you know, to upgrade themselves, to embrace technology, to embrace digital technology, uh, touch and go figures, uh, which is in the open source. I think the number of merchants have grown from 30,000 to about 1 million in just two years, 2021. 20, so then you can see how fast, uh, you know, just to give you the right, uh, just to give you the perspective, how fast uh, people have adopted, um, you know, digital technology. So to us, you know, e-wallet, um, you know, becoming uh, cashless going, and then to me, that's, uh, that's digital already. So that's how fast the pace is, okay? And then um, some of those who managed to diversify, I call them diversify. Uh, of course, cash is still there, cash is still in circulation. Uh, but then, uh, you know, those who managed to go online, uh, because they couldn't do anything offline at that time. Uh, I've seen one particular live case myself uh, because we were still very much operating. A lot of friends asked me, wow, then you guys have been have, having holidays in the last couple of years. No, uh, even though uh, some branches were closed, you know, tight operation, uh, operating times, uh, hours and SOP, but uh, uh, most of us uh, were, were working very uh, hard uh, behind the scene in how to, you know, how to... Uh, 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 execute uh, most of the uh, government's um, uh, assistance programs during that time. Now, uh, there was this particular client, I won't mention the name because of PDPA, uh, you know, they managed to bring their electric shop, electronic shop online, instead of just, you know, the usual traditional way of selling, uh, you know, in a shop, bricks and mortar. And then the turnover, the turnover, because that time we all couldn't go out, you have to do your own home uh, home cooking, and then as a result, you need uh, well, you need to keep your aircon running instead of going to the office. So you need to have aircon and things like that. And some aircon broke down and things like that. You need a new TV set, uh, you need new gadgets and things like that. You know to adapt yourself to working from home. And then as a result, the business boom for this particular client. Uh, you know something like uh, I saw the uh, audited reports. Uh, it was like something like a million to 10 million, from a million to 10 million in the space of two years. And that is what, that is like a thousand percent growth. Is, is it, uh, do I get it right? From 1 million to 10 million. So it's like 1000 percent growth. Um, yeah, those is just one of the good examples. And I also have a very unfortunate one. Uh, it's got like, you know, 50 to 70 shops over the country. Uh, and then, uh, because of this MCO, then he had to, uh, he had to sell off his car, he had to sell off his house, not at a very ideal time, and he suffered quite some losses. Uh, but just to keep the outgoings down, to survive, uh, and then, uh, but fortunately for him, fortunately because of uh, all these. Uh, uh, you know, programs uh, by the government, especially uh, uh, whether good or not, that one yet to be seen. Uh, but then a lot of uh, liquidity, uh, whether from own sources or from the government, uh, have been pumped into the economy. And as a result, I think in, the, in this uh, raya season, this year, he managed to do 160% compared to 2019 before COVID. 160%. So to him, now, he told me this quote, everything is back. Everything comes back. Whatever he lost, now comes back. So that is a matter of, uh, you know, this is, this is the kind, we are looking at businessmen, you know. Businessmen, you need to have this kind of courage. You need to have this kind of uh, uh, attitude, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, our values in you. Uh, as in like, okay, bad times, I'm willing to sacrifice everything, but I have to have some form of buffer to prepare myself when it comes back, when the time comes back. So I've seen some good examples. I've seen some uh, uh, successful uh, uh, people, uh, 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 but I've also seen some, some people who have to, uh, until now, they still cannot survive. They still cannot come back. So, so very unfortunate to the uh, tourism sector. The tourism sector is widely publicized that they have suffered a lot until even until now. So then uh, I think um, uh, maybe this digital, um, you know, with the uh, higher adoption rate now, 
uh, perhaps it can bring some very positive and drastic uh, changes uh, to all of us and or to all the uh, you know the uh, to the SME community. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so there are some people who have actually thrived, right? Despite all the doom and gloom that is there. And of course, I think as we've recently just heard, revenge spending kind of is real for some sectors. Um, so just like to turn the attention now to money match, right? A lot of it is transactional, right? For money to pass from one hand to another. What have you been seeing in your industry? Um, yeah, first of all, thanks very much for the introduction uh, and uh, invite to be up here as well, Jonathan. Uh, thanks, Hollis, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Nisan Munusami. I'm the co-founder of Money Match. Uh, and very similar sentiments as well to Paul, actually. Uh, I wouldn't say some, actually, I'll say the majority. So just taking into account the official Bandagara figures, we actually, the uh, economy actually grew over 8% uh, at the last, uh, the GDP-wise, over the last quarter itself. That, that speaks volumes about it, right? Are you telling me before the pandemic, uh, there were no such thing as a bad business? Bad businesses die all the time. Bad businesses men will also die all the time, per se. It's nothing got to do with the pandemic. That is obviously the travel and tourism sector, which is truly, specially, really got hit very hard. But again, we find the majority of people who are doing that probably by the mid of 2020, end of 2020, we're already moving on. Today, they're probably already doing something else, importing goods or, for, or so on and so forth, right? Uh, so from that sense as well, we see a lot of our end ground SME customers uh, really growing and thriving uh, throughout the last two years. And if you didn't grow and thrive, you shouldn't be doing business. Go and work for a normal company, a Petronas, or something like that to say, right? So that's actually about uh, echoing his point about doing business per se, right? So, and in SME, you're doing business, you know, it's not as if you're working for an oil and gas company or, or a big four or something like that. Kind of, like, it's a very different top perspective. Um, so, yeah, if you couldn't try for the past couple of years, you don't, shouldn't be doing business. Simple as that, right? Um, but actually, I, want, I wanted to actually touch more about it's actually linking the two topics about um, financial inclusion and SME. And that's actually something that we see a lot here at Money Match, actually, right? Uh, just touching upon what um, uh, Dr. Aswell was just saying about the informal economy, that is something that, that's a superb example. That is literally a fintech. That is literally a securitized BNPL. <laughs> that's literally what it is, right? And it's brilliant. It's totally informal. Uh, but that's very much something that should not be informal. You can look at my own dressing. It's completely informal, right? I myself am obviously not a believer in any forms of business attire, formal attire. Please be there, done that, right? Uh, no offense, guys. But yeah, it's just... Your own, my own perspective about when we look at the informal uh, activities here in the market and we see how uh, vast it truly is per se, right? And actually over the last uh, couple of years, 100% uh, Paul's point about the touch and go data, it is so, so bloody true. And what I call this is a democratization of finance. Well, basically in the past, well, I'm not saying like before, but I mean, like 10 years ago, like 15, 20 years ago, it was not that easy to do business. You either got to have a papa or mama or something like that per se or some context or something along that kind of line. Or not, you, you go and work your normal job. You save up money after 10, 15 years uh, and then you start your own business, right? Uh, that's a little bit of how it used to be in the olden days. Uh, but today, it's extremely different. I've got customers and auntie literally in Trenganu uh, and how to see sell uh, products to TikTok live streaming. There's no bank involved at all. TikTok makes the direct payments out to her when she makes the sales. TikTok Malaysia and mean, ByteDance Malaysia. That's an example. Completely informal. You won't see to the banking side, but I actually see that per se because they actually, like a lot of them are importing products and so forth. Beauty uh, and uh, cosmetics as well is so, so huge. It's one of my major sectors for money match over the last couple of years as well. Beauty and cosmetics. And most of this is very, very small scale entrepreneurs actually are from the B40. And this is the best chance for, well, not all the B40, but those who are hardworking enough in the B40 who wants to bring themselves up is true SME. It's true starting their own business. It's not true going and work in a normal job where you had to compete against kids from university or Nottingham and suddenly kids and all that kind of stuff. If you just went to a lousy college, you know, whatever, Jaffa College is somewhere in the middle of nowhere, there's no chance to enter EY or PWC. But through doing business, you can lift yourself up the B40 into the T20 truly by doing business. And 20, 30 years ago, it was really difficult. But today, you can just open your live streaming shop. Shopee is just one example. TikTok is even bigger than here was before, right? Facebook and, and uh, uh, all this live, Instagram live streaming and whatnot. So it's huge. And all these are all payment channels where you just go to direct bank transfers as well. Or in some of the cases like ByteDance and all that, they actually handle the payments as well. Sh uh, uh, Shopee and all that, they have their own ecosystem, their own e-wallet. All is not really going through the banking channels. No offense. Uh, but data and data is actually very, very true. These are all really, really small entrepreneurs. They only need to import maybe their first ticket like 10, 20,000 ringgit. They use the Alipay because, you know, they're always smart these days to go and find all these OEM shops in... Um, 
in China, Shenzhen and whatnot per se. Then when it comes to the payments, oh, it's above the credit card limits, then they need to go ahead and make payments. They can use MoneyMax, for example, they can use a bank, for example. And that's really when the tickets are very small. The tickets are so small, they don't have a credit history. More often than not, they cannot actually get any kinds of uh, financing more than not, right? But the last couple of years, a lot of the major banks together with the government has helped out quite a fair bit. Today, you've also got alternative financing channels like peer-to-peer -peer financing guys as well, uh, and uh, other channels like equity crowdfunding per se, and so on and so forth for very small businesses as well. Even Islamic equity crowdfunding as well, such as MicroLeap and so on and so forth. So I would say that actually today, if you really want to lift yourself up, it is easier than it ever was before. When I started off Money Match as well a few years ago, it was thanks to the government accelerators, or five years ago, sorry, government accelerators and so on and so forth. 25 years ago, there was no such thing as an accelerator for your tech company. I would have had to back my father for hundreds of thousands to win it. I didn't need to do that. Uh, I just went to the government processes, accelerator, proof my business model, uh, start going with Benegada, get into the sandbox, and so on and so forth. So I would actually argue that more than ever before, the, the gaps between financial inclusion, uh, the walls between financial inclusion and B40 are actually thinning more than ever before. And I actually see the opportunities in the SME space, digital finance, digital entrepreneurship, as it is the best possible way for the B40 to actually step out of their way, exactly as what we've been seeing some of the hardworking aunties and other, but it's not for everyone, right? Business is not for everyone. But actually today, the step up there is easier than ever before as commerce, social commerce, uh, whether it's live streaming or old school shop, uh, so on and so forth, is still one of the major points in this country uh, that is still very much growing and even in this region as well. So I'll say there's pretty positive sentiments going forward. Not all businesses, there are certain pockets such as obviously um, the travels got hit really, really hard, but I would say that by today, majority of the sectors have come back already by this time. Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. See, the story is up to that <laughs> stage. I just want to add a bit more uh, to that story, but this is a continuation. So then with all these opportunities, why is there still those who are underserved or those underprivileged, those who are not included? Why? You know, one of the reasons is the access to the, all the government grants and the financing is because they're not keeping proper records. Yeah, is, this is still there. Even last week, I think there was a news about most of the MSME, micro SMEs, are not pro uh, keeping proper records. Therefore, they have difficulty in evaluating the financial performance. So there comes this uh, old boring accounting. But you still need that because uh, it is about record. So if you don't like the word accounting, take that away. So I was informed that not many do like to, to do accounting, but it is record. It's about evaluating your performance and knowing where does your money go and how to strategize. So this is where I think knowledge, uh, knowledge is important. And therefore, uh, government, AKPK, for example, Bank Negara, uh, is working towards, you know, educating all these entrepreneurs, formal or informal, you know, TikTok entrepreneurs or Shopee entrepreneurs, keep your record so you know how much you have to pay, how much your money comes in, and how much take-home money that you can have. So records is very important. So that's where some of them along the way, and from the record of bankruptcy, they were some have bankruptcy problem as well because businesses are so good and they went to buy Lamborghini. <laughs> uh, because it's, you know, money comes so much, like millions, and suddenly they forget that they have to reinvest to their business. And then you can see few young entrepreneurs, all these cos cosmetics, <laughs> they bought Lamborghini, you know, and Ferrari and showing off. So that's where sometimes they are excluded because of one simple thing that can happen. So that's so, yeah, <laughs> continuation. Thank you very much. So now I know where all those YouTube videos or TikTok videos that say, you know, I bought a million ringgit house or I bought a Lamborghini comes from, right? I'm pretty sure many of you have seen like all of these influencers that at some point they will release such a video and you go like, how did they do that? Maybe I should consider being an influencer myself or do all of these things on TikTok, right? But I think that there are two themes coming out here. So one is that technology is great. A lot of people are doing businesses online, especially micro entrepreneurs who many years ago would find it very, very difficult for them to just scale their business or get started. 
Right? So previously, there's an information gap. Where do I find customers? How do customers reach me? And all of these informal systems that sadly, perhaps maybe the formal banking system haven't caught on yet, um, are losing out because these transactions are just happening over platforms like maybe WhatsApp, Telegram, or Money Match. Uh, but then there's also the part where, where there is this gloom story that people are being left out as something that Gias mentioned. And we know the stat statistics, people are being left out. And, and what we just heard from Dr. Noor is that a lot of it has to do with education, right? That missing part of it, like knowing where to go and how to do it. And once you have it, how do you keep it and not waste it away? So with a lot of this new technology that's on the horizon, um, perhaps like to direct this question specifically to Nathan first, like Money Match recently got the digital banking license, right? So what is on the horizon? Let's try to close that educational gap through this, through this program. Like if you want to start your SME, you know, what is there in terms of tech that you could take advantage of? Um, well, quite a fair bit, right? So I think like uh, also addressing the, the point that Dr. Noah mentioned about the lack of records, right? That's really, really interesting. And I was on, I've been on a BFM and all that with friends of mine from Cap Bay, uh, Capital Bay and whatnot, but it's the same problem, right? I cannot give you even however much alternative algorithmic AI lending if I cannot even see your freaking cash flow, right? Um, so talking about digital bank, before I get to money maps per se. Your blockchain um, help? Uh, not really, not really, to be very honest per se. There's a, it's a tool and enabler. It doesn't really change the game per se. Um, that digital banking potentially to certain aspects will change the game. Before I talk about money match, I talk about Shopee, my semi-enemy, not really enemy, partner friend per se. Um, uh, because Shopee actually now, if you choose to be an entrepreneur and you only open on Shopee, you don't open on Lazada, you don't open on TikTok, actually Shopee has all your records. And with the bank now, Shopee one year from now will start offering the SME lending, which is part and parcel of this entire ecosystem per se, right? Uh, two of us are actually Islamic out of the five. Uh, so Aeon and ourselves, Money Match also will be doing more on the Islamic side of things per se. But you can understand per se whereby um, digital banking and what you mean to SME. We're not really going to go out there and uh, compete against a Maybank or CIMB per se. That's not the business model. Obviously, Ben Negara will not let that as well happen anyway. Um, we all have our own very unique business models and all of it is very much serving that internal ecosystem, right? So, using Shopee again, right? I'm a Changanu auntie. I say, okay, I shut down my Lazada. I consolidate everything with Shopee. That's why Shopee versus one lah, of course, right? More margins for them, right? So, it all goes, everybody benefits, of course, right? Uh, but now, if you use only exclusively Shopee, for example, Shopee will start offering you financing because they can see all the income and outgoings and they can minus off before they give you the money money they are in full control more control than even a bank i always tell my banker friends it's actually not money mess or that shopee is your number one enemy they're going to come and wreck you guys but that same trangano auntie was also not really using a maybe as enemy before she could not even get a loan before so this is actually how shopee is truly serving an underserved economy all five of us have our business plans obviously grab super a lot of uh, freelance riders who cannot even get banking loans and so on and so forth uh, money match to our own consortium uh, and we have certain i cannot reveal too much but we have certain uh, plans more islamic in nature you, uh, uh, pretty much per se, but we have pretty uh, big consortium partners. One simple example is Kasim. They're also in our consortium. I'm pretty sure most of you guys know Kasim. Uh, they themselves have over 7 million data points out of 35 million relations. So that brings them up to like a Maybank uh, CIMB level overnight per se. Literally, customers have already done um, transactions over there or given them uh, details for financing. Uh, and for example, how many B40 markets over there who can simply get a simple loan for a MyV? Simple loan for a uh, for a uh, uh, Viva or whatnot per se, right? Because they themselves don't come from a B forty or even the M forty uh, per se, right? Don't really have enough financial records per se. But now we can actually go in there and do something because we see a different aspects of the alternative data. Uh, so I would say that coming on one year from now, definitely the advance of the digital banks, all five of us will have very specific benefits to all types of the ecosystem per se. Uh, but it's still certain sectors. I would, it's still not to say that the economy in the whole is humongous, right? There's still there's just so much out to be tackled as well, per se. So I would say that it's a step, but you only see probably the real impact five years from now. I know it sounds a bit long time, but it takes a while for all these banks. It will take a long while. Five years, you start seeing the real impact grow over time. Cool. I'm very excited for the next five years. Um, I'd like to turn the attention to Gias. So what's in it for individuals and families? What are their financial um financial opportunities that they are there, like, you know, personal lending, for example. Um, and also like to expand it a little bit, right? So a lot of our talk recently has been about Malaysia, but globally, are there any best practices available? Yeah, in terms of looking at it from an individual perspective, I think um, 
uh, you know, and, and the technologies out there. I think access still remains a, a problem, although at a global level, we have uh, account ownership of about 75, 70, uh, 76%. Uh, close to a billion uh, people, adults, uh, still lack access to a formal digital transaction account. So there's a lot out there. So a basic uh, payments uh, instrument or a mechanism is 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 a, a window or like a, a rail towards broader value-added fin financial services. So we are seeing a lot of innovations on that front. In, in Malaysia also, we see and uh, Mr. Paul also mentioned about uh, the digital payments, uh, specifically QR-based payments uh, happening. Uh, but at the, at the back end, um, the regulators are also playing a, a big role in creating retail payment systems, instant and fast retail payment systems to facilitate interoperable retail payments. So anyone with a Maybank account or a wallet is able to transfer or receive funds from any other wallet or so although the front end looks fancy there's a lot of work that goes at the back end right so uh, regulators uh, private sector players are working towards uh, making the payment systems efficient not only domestically but also cross border right so that's that's where uh, fintechs like money match are also playing a big role but also um, you see bnm uh, for example talking to Singapore, Thailand, and other countries in the region to connect their retail payment system so that the cross-border payments for individuals uh, as well as small businesses becomes uh, efficient, convenient, and at a lower cost, actually. So that's at payment level, right? But beyond payments, uh, we also talked about, uh, you know, borrowing, for example, right? So, uh, you know, alternate data-based uh, lending for uh, individuals, uh, gold-based loans. So again, um, gold-based savings also, you know, reverse savings. This has become a very important use case, uh, especially within Asia. I mean, as a Asians, we uh, gold is an important asset for us, not only financially, but also from a cultural standpoint, right? So there are many fintechs offering uh, dematerialized uh, gold saving services. So you, you invest as small as five, 10 ringgits um, a week, and then you accumulate and then one year, two years down the line, if you want to buy a physical form of that gold, you can uh, do that or you can sell it in the open market to, for, for, for getting money actually. So uh, these kind of um, uh, you know, services are offering, more sophisticated services are also coming. Um, so for example, if you want to invest in uh, mutual funds, if you want to invest in securities, right? Um, a large factor, if you look at, I mean, again, uh, if you look at how the equities have fared in Asian markets, many of the Asian markets as compared to uh, a US or a European market, the, the performance has been bad, but relatively better than the developed countries. One reason for that is the domestic retail investments have, uh, have boosted and the foreign institutional uh, investors going away have been replaced by a more resilient domestic retail investment uh, ecosystem actually, right? Uh, so that's netting out and, and it's largely thanks to the innovations that we are seeing in this uh, sector lately. Um, so that's- That's on really cool on the gold part because um, two things, I think I remember reading uh, at one point uh, when South Korea during 1997, they were in financial trouble, like people actually gave their gold that they kept in the house to the government to help repay the debts that they were there. And I think in Malaysia, we, we wanted to do something similar as well, but probably we didn't use gold. Um, the other part of it was that I guess I don't have to keep gold under my bed. I can just buy a small part of it via a fintech firm and then cash it out later on. But with all this talk about individual financing, right? And financing for, for micro entrepreneurs who may not actually have much business experience, right? There's, so, there's this part where, where regulation may need to come in. Right? There's this talk about predatory lending, buy now, pay later. How should this come in the picture right? so that we can, as much as the benefits we want to reap and harness, how do we prevent and, or minimize the downsides? I'll open it up for anyone. Yeah, uh, actually, 
uh, especially lately, you can see that there are many uh, risks out there, especially to uh, people on the street who may not realize what they got themselves into. There, there are many. First, for example, on the offer, uh, especially if you talk about, uh, say, B40 or the, the, the sections which are probably not very educated, for example, uh, there's a lot of probably people who get these, uh, uh, you know, the, the cabutan bertuah, like you can uh, be entitled to free gifts and all that. In lottery, so, right? Yeah. And they send it to your uh, phone, not sometimes using WhatsApp, but the normal messages. You are entitled to free gift and you just need to click this link. And that goes to everyone. And at the end, you know, they are uh, involved in scam. And some, uh, because of that channel, through the telephone, through digital platform, they are actually, uh, you know, they're being induced to surrender their bank account and their bank accounts are being used as uh, mules account, yeah, for uh, money laundering. That is more, I think, risky. That's scary. And uh, sometimes they're also duped to buy things that they don't want to, especially all these special offers and all that. Even Shopee, you get all the Shopee vouchers through your WhatsApp. Okay, and you know, you still have one ringgit voucher, but you end up using that one ringgit purchasing something that is 200. Yeah, so that one ringgit means nothing. So this is where this financial literacy and discipline and education is very important. And now that we are grappling with the cost, the, the, the price of goods have been increasing, it's also about uh, harnessing. That goes back to the word harness. Harness means you utilize what you have to make it good. So you need to know how you want to use your digital for a good cause. For example, there is one app, Price Catcher. You can download the app. It's from the KPDNKK. And you can find uh, which supermarket sell the cheapest chicken. Yeah? Uh, or the cheapest groceries. You can see if you are now in Sunway, you download the app and you find which supermarket sell the cheapest groceries. So harness it, use it for the good, and also be careful with the risk that you may be uh, enticed you know to 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 be disadvantaged you may be enticed to uh, to scam uh, so that's why it's about knowledge about knowledge how to use so inclusion means you have it you have access but you know how to use so that's why knowledge is important yeah because we are talking now to people at large yeah people who may have knowledge may be certain percentage yeah, maybe 10%, 20%, but those who have the phone, they have access, but they may not have the right knowledge to use the digital uh, tools. So that is where I think the downside that, uh, that's where we, especially those uh, in the higher learning education, you all are the hope of the nation to spread this knowledge, yeah, to make sure we share the good knowledge. Yeah. So, thank yeah, you very I much. Think, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I echo what the doctor just said very much. Um, I think that you borrow for two reasons. Okay, so um, money transfer and all those are transactional. So, um, won't, I won't be too worried about that. Um, today, I'm speaking as a person here. I'm not representing any uh, institution. So, it's more like kind of like a personal advice, a personal opinion. So from what I see, what I've uh, observed is that you borrow for two reasons. Either one, either you borrow to consume or you borrow to invest. Okay, you consume or you can, you know, buy something that you like or you buy something that is necessary to you, necessity. Okay, so now if you borrow to invest, you are investing for your future. You're investing to grow your business for a bigger business perhaps business expansion if you may in the future so that you know you can grow from today and a micro a nano even uh, to micro to small medium 
Uh, by the way, uh, you know, there are different categories of SME, starting from uh, micro, officially, officially, starting from micro, about 300,000 turnover or five employees, whichever is lower. Then going up to small, you're talking about, uh, you know, you have manufacturers and you have uh, those in the services sector. If you ask me, who are those in the services sector? Anything that is not manufacturing. Okay, so it's really that simple. So if you go up, uh, if you go up the ladder, you will have like, uh, you know, uh, 75 employees or uh, up to like uh, something like uh, uh, 20 million turnover for the services or 50 million turnover for the manufacturers. So those are the numbers, uh, uh, you know, for these SMEs to be uh, categorized and to be uh, given, you know, a different kind of uh, uh, assistance from time to time. Now, the thing is, you want to move from micro to small to medium and hopefully one day you go for IPO. Uh, 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 those are the kind, if not, then why are you in business? If you are in business just to make a living, then of course, uh, I think that is also a good reason. But for those who are ambitious enough, you want to do business, then you want to do it bigger and bigger over time. So you want business expansion. And that's the very good reason for you to borrow money. I say it's very good reason, productive reason for you to borrow. Now, if you want to go for, and bear in mind, Money doesn't come free. You're talking about borrowing future money for your consumption today, right? So it doesn't come free. So there is a cost to it. Just like, you know, when you buy a bottle of water for reselling, being a retailer, it comes with a cost. And when you sell it, you want to make a profit margin so that your business can be sustainable. So sustainability is the keyword here. How, when you do business, how you want your business to be sustainable and grow at the same time. If you don't make profit, then you can't, you can't grow. All right. So net digital, um, you know, those uh, who have not been uh, 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 included in the financials, um, um, in, the, in, the, in the financing space, now you have another avenue for you to borrow. Maybe easier, faster, or that, which doesn't mean cheaper. Okay, it depends on the algorithm, depends on the experience. Because banking interest is like this, uh, interest uh, on borrowing is like, it works like this. If the bad loans, NPL is high, if the NPL is high, then the interest will be charged higher. So higher risk, higher interest. Higher risk, higher interest. This is really as simple as that. Okay, so now I think the effort is, to how to try to minimize the MPL, non-performing loan. We call it non-performing loan. So are we using the right method? Are we using the right algorithm? Are we using the right data? I think that this morning session was very interesting. You know, if you use the wrong data, if you use the wrong algorithm, then it becomes biased. If it becomes biased, then the loans that you approve may not generate enough return for you given the price that you charge. So that is, um, you know, from the lender's point of view. But from the borrower's point of view, I have been quite involved in the financial literacy training. So I've been training, uh, you know, giving talks to a lot of SMEs, right? So a lot of, I, I realized one thing, a lot of them, they just wake up, all right, uh, sometimes you have, they have a dream, they have some, some kind of uh, idealism that they want to achieve. Now, that's one keyword there that they, uh, to all of you that you have to bear in mind. Okay, you want to achieve your dream? Fine. You want to do your business? Good. That's very good. But think of this word sustainability and scalability for growth. All right. So you have to know how to monetize uh, from what you do, how to generate profit for your business. Now, I like that example. We make profit, we don't spend it. You spend it on luxurious items, on cars, on houses. Okay, I think that is another form of investment. Car, you know, sometimes maybe you need to drive a big car, a fanciful car, in order to meet your clients so that, you know, that will add to your credibility. Because they can't see you your can bank statements. You rent a car now, though. <laughs> yeah, they can't see your bank statements. They can't see your bank records, but they, see, they can see your car. Oh, you're driving an e-cars. So I can give you 30 days of credit, no problem. Uh, you are driving, no offense, you're driving a smaller car. Cash term, please. 
you know, that kind of things happen in the real world. So then things may change, technology may change, uh, but then human nature doesn't change much. So you're talking about many thousand years ago, you know, since we have civilization, until today, you're still looking more or less about the same kind of behaviors, right? And there comes the psycho, uh, psychometric, yeah, which can also be used to uh, to be the uh, you know to be the uh, one of the uh, credit approving criteria. So then I, I think fundamentally what I'm trying to bring out here is that know what you do, borrow for what you need. Okay, so that comes the financial literacy in a nutshell. Okay, so then of course there will be other things for you to learn. So learning is nonstop. So you spend three or four years to earn your degree. Yeah, so then to be a successful businessman, do you know how many years you have to learn? You multiply that by two times or three times. So it's a lifelong learning, okay? So uh, I think financial literacy um, or even entrepreneurship, these are not small items. These are big topics for everyone to learn. And uh, I hope we can do more because all of you, I invite all of you, Let's do more because you're all learned uh, souls. You're all intelligent uh, people here. Let's see how together, you know, digitally or uh, traditionally, conventionally, how we can, uh, you know, bring up this group because they are not, they are a very significant group, the SME community. They are a very significant group because together, collectively, they employ about half the country's workforce. I always have this belief if they do better together, collectively, we will all do better together. Okay, uh, that's... Uh, take Thank you very much. I think that's why we do programs like this, right? Because if we think about it, education should not be confined to just particular individuals, certain books, but it should be an ecosystem thing where we can all sort of share best practices to everyone, for everywhere. Because if, as long as people are not left behind and we can all grow, we... Only then can we grow as a whole together. And if we want to talk about nation building, I think that's the best approach. Um, over to Gias, I see you have the mic there. What can governments do? Yes, yeah, that's a topic close to my heart and also uh, the work that I do. So spare me three, four minutes there. <laughs> so, uh, so let me provide uh, some context here. Again, some, some numbers from the research done in Malaysia. So 40% of the adults um, who have responded to this survey say that um, they are very worried um, for uh, being able to meet expenses in the event of a health shock or an emergency, right? And to give another number, 60% of the respondents uh, say that they are still recovering from the financial shocks of uh, COVID-19, right? These two numbers. And looking at the the digital angle now right um so the the key elements of uh, digital are two things actually first is uh, the accessibility part so earlier you had to go to a bank branch give 10 uh, different documents and then uh, then you the bank will take 10 days so on and so forth right that is one um, so digital solves that issue. You need to sit here. You can sit here and you, you can access a loan from where you are now, right? The other is scalability, right? Uh, so uh, if each of you uh, uh, try to apply for a loan from, say, CIMB or Money Match, um, immediately, you know, you have 100 customers here who are seated wherever they are comfortably, you know, applying for loans. So the scalability from technology-based business models is really high and the accessibility is also very high. When you contextualize it with the fact that uh, the, the financial health is still vulnerable for most of the segments and more so for B40, it becomes rather spurious, right? So that's where the, the task of governments and uh, financial regulators becomes cut out and digital financial literacy is really very important and i go beyond literacy it's not just being aware of the fact that you should not spend it right you should not spend beyond your means it's the awareness but it's beyond awareness it's about change in um, attitudes and behaviors actually 
beyond awareness it's change in attitude and behavior that we are driving at as as a regulator or a government right so we are cu currently working with uh, the asean regulators in in developing a digital financial literacy strategy so which could be uh, brought in towards the national financial education and capability programs that they are doing in terms of uh, you know working with private sector players in terms of um, de developing their own programs on enhancing the literacy and capability of uh, the the various segments and specifically focusing on the vulnerable segments uh, to 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 advance digital financial inclusion so that's on the capability front right but capability is just one part of the entire ecosystem right so there are issues related to security when you access a digital device to pay or to avail a loan right there are issues related to data privacy and there are issues related to fair conduct right is so for example uh, i am from india i want to send money to india if i go to a branch this is the actual example right i want to send maybe a thousand dollars to my parents uh, who are dependent on me uh, back home in india so i go to a branch i say i want to say i want to send thousand uh, dollars the banker says uh, okay well we charge four dollars flat for thousand dollars right but he also says we also charge some amount that i am not aware of right the banker himself is not aware of a hidden charge that goes when when a cross border remittance happens so it could be for four dollars plus 25 dollars or 50 dollars or 60 dollars those are correspondent banking charges apparently so so there are hidden fees like imagine you're going into a a starbucks and you order a coffee the the cashier says uh, whatever 10 ringgit for a latte but there is a hidden charge to it after you buy i will tell you how much additional charge you have to pay right it's it's rather you know spurious in that sense right so that's where regulators also come in in providing in ensuring that there is transparency in the fee in disclosure of terms and conditions in language that i as a uh, as as a lame person can can understand who is not financially sophisticated can understand right the i should be able to understand the terms and com conditions in a easily understandable manner right so these are the various aspects where regulators have a clear role to play and we see bnm regulators within the region are are acting both on the uh, uh, literacy capability side but also on the consumer protection side by issuing reg regulations on consumer protection with specific relevance to digital financial services and also on digital lending bnpl so on and so forth actually thank you very much so i think there's two sides to it right one is personal discipline what you can do yourself for yourself your family or your business and the other part is where governments come in to say that you know as individuals i think we had a conversation with one of you just now that humans beings are lazy uh, we don't want to analyze every single thing that we do that's why we trust brands that's why we trust institutions and institutions therefore play have a certain sense of responsibility they, they need to have that responsibility to do it right to ensure that information is accurate and and people don't get cheated along the way. I guess that's why governments come in, right? I think Mr. Nason will have a lot of things to say about our remittances, but we kind of have to wrap up this session. So um, maybe we can just merge it with the final question. So we want to turn the tables around, right? So we have spoken a lot about how businesses can cope with this new, with this new era, new technology. We spoke about here how individuals can adapt to it and the need for government to step in further but what can people do today to help the ecosystem? Um, should they use, should they move away from banks? <laughs> or should they... <laughs> no, never. <laughs> should, they, should they write to their MPs and say that you need, you know, we need better policies on this. So what should people do? Um, let's start from Dr. Noor. Yes, but spoken for the last time. Sure, sure. Okay, I, I, I guess you started yes, first. Yes. 
Uh, yeah. First and foremost, please do try out MoneyMax. Uh, we don't have any hidden charges. <laughs> it's one of the underlying <laughs> fundamentals of my company. Uh, I, we, I, I know certain airlines, right, where you buy the tickets cheap, yeah. but later yeah. you have to pay for a lot of other stuff. Uh, yeah, let's not mention the name of that capital airline. But yeah, so, <laughs> but, yeah please do try out MoneyMax. Our entire business proposition is made upon uh, absorbing in every single bit of intermediary charges so you will never get the other side charge. And we use, do use a blockchain network to fight against the intermediary bank charges, to be clear on that part. Okay. Uh, but I won't talk too much about that part. Please do download the app and try it out yourself. Um, I think by getting into like what you guys can do right now, and I touched a little bit about the regulation part as well, is that you'd be actually quite surprised to find out that Malaysia, together with Singapore, of course, are probably two of some of the most advanced uh, countries in ASEAN region with very pro uh, financial policies and regulatory policies that allow for innovation in the financial sector. This is clearly evident through the Banagada Fintech Sandbox, also through the Securities Commission on multiple new types of licenses that makes it very easy to get in. In the past, be like, oh, fund manager or so on. So well, now you can do a digital, uh, you know, uh, program, digital channel, and still get an SE license with bare minimum uh, requirements. So the regulation has already moved quite a lot in that space. Singapore also, of course, I'm not saying that Malaysia is higher, but together with Singapore, Malaysia is one of the best guys around. There's another case about enforcement i won't go into it enforcement is a bit of an issue or the scams and all that that's a that's a different conversation for a different day per se but what i'll get into is like what everybody can do over here um i wouldn't advise everybody to start your own startup <laughs> uh, more often than not uh no offense but for first graduates it's a little bit more difficult to get your funding and get to the trust and so on and so forth uh, i myself only started my own startup after like 10 years of working experience for your guide um so generally speaking i wouldn't say go and start your own startup just just yet unless unless you're development funding or uh, what you believe to be a fantastic idea. Uh, but do, if you are interested, do get involved in the space. I'm not saying join money maps per se. There's actually so many options out there, whether it's in education, even in government. Uh, even banks have digital innovation space, uh, digital um, um, uh, programs where they actually have very specifically looking into expanding out the bank, CIMB, Maybank, you can see all the latest all the latest platforms and all that. Their apps sometimes are even better than most of the fintechs out there. So there's also, within the banks, also there are many, many divisions which are very, very uh, innovative as well. Uh, what more regulators and all that. So I'll say that if you're truly, truly interested, get your hands dirty, get into the space a little bit over the next three to five years per se, because then only you have a deeper understanding actually about the on-the-ground issues, the on-the-ground realities. And then with that kind of better set, I would then definitely encourage you guys to, well, either explore overseas to learn further or maybe even start your own businesses or start your own fintech per se, but at least with a few years of relevant experience, not necessarily in the bank or fintech, can even be in government, can even be in education. There are many areas that touches upon uh, fintech financial inclusion, financial innovation as well. So that'll just be my last look from my side. Thank you. Yep. So uh, I think I have two areas that I would like to share with you. First, uh, in terms of policy, I think uh, our country, you know, has, uh, has worked so hard, you know, try to put the right policy, the right motivation, the right encouragement uh, to get our nation to be digital and to also uh, encourage digital inclusion, to, to also ensure everyone is, is included. So you can see that from budget, for example, you can see that from uh, government initiative call. Uh, it's a blueprint called My Digital. Go and visit the web page. My Digital looks at six trusts. Uh, first is to ha to have hundred percent digital knowledge among government sectors, and to ensure digital talent is available, and to ensure uh, emerging technologies innovation among companies. So those those there are six trusts from My Digital, and then we have IR four point zero framework. Go and look at that because I'm involved in all those uh, rollouts. And then the latest yesterday, uh, the most announced about a roadmap for five industries, e and &E, Electrical Engineering, I think, and then a few more, I can't remember that all. So, and at the same time, because when government came up with My Digital, all agencies are together. MDAC, you know, uh, mostly professional bodies, Bank Negara, SSM, you name it. We were all in that you know, hundreds of us when we had the meeting because try to make sure we are all inclusive and we are in collaboration so that my digital is still ongoing and there's a lot of opportunities for all young talent. A lot, but you need to access, again, to access, get information about that and you need to know what it's all about. So government, we are not lack of, the government are not lack of programs. But sometimes, you know, 
uh, the civil society are not taking that opportunity and not grabbing it to make it good for yourself. So as much as we bring water to the horse, if the horse does not drink it, then it's, you know, it's useless. So that's where I think awareness means you get people to know, you spread the knowledge and you share within your WhatsApp, you share within your group about this good information, relevant information. Okay, that's one thing. And the other thing, you all will be going up to work. You'll be part of an uh, organization, will be part of the business. You see, business, they are in the bell curve. There are those who are laggards, you know, though they are business, but they've not moved. And those who are actually trendsetter, they're early adopters. Yeah, like money match and all that. They're all, you know, trendsetter. But there are still business, there are laggards within the bell curve. I think there's still quite certain percentage laggards where you can see they don't have laptops. They, they have monitor 386. Still that kind of business are there. Yeah, and so during pandemic, they were most affected because they can't go to office. They can't access their data. They still need to look for the hard files. And their invoices are still hard invoices. Yes, that happened. We saw that during the pandemic, especially from my point of view, when they couldn't file in their, uh, uh, you know, the IRB yeah, submission. <laughs> because invoices are all in office, cannot go to office. We still have that kind of this. So your role as the young talent is to help transformation within these laggards. Yeah, those are still there. And uh, trust me, so that's uh, your role as well. So two Two, I think two angle is when you work, play that role to transform and also to disseminate the information about all the government initiatives. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm being very conscious of time here. We have to move to the Q&A session. But maybe Mr. Paul and Gias just give one liners just to close this part. Um. I think I will still go back to the literacy, uh, financial literacy, uh, education, you know, financial discipline, all those sort of things. But in addition to that, I think um, to the audience, I think a lot of you, because of the theme today, I think a lot of you have an interest in the digital world. So then I think the question is, uh, yeah, a lot of talks on big data, a lot of talks in uh, uh, IoT or digital uh, financial uh, inclusion, those sort of things. But uh, you guys can also look into how you can bring about changes uh, in terms of technology to productive, uh, pro to productive uh, purposes. For example, how do you use uh, IoT, big data, to help the farmers, yeah, to help them to produce more, how to um, you know, use sensors, sort of things. Uh, this is, I think, you know, talking about uh, the farmers' food supply, uh, food supply and uh, uh, agriculture in general in this country, uh, I think we used to import only 30% of what we eat. But today is the other way around. Today we import 70% of what we eat. And given the backdrop of uh, pandemic, you know, food shortages worldwide, that's perhaps is something we can do. Uh, that's one way. And I like this uh, sustainably very much. You know, the moment I walked into the university this morning, all the 17 goals, you know, have been there in a very big way. All the uh, sustainability development goals uh, by uh, United Nations, those are your opportunities. How do you make changes to the world while you know, having a career or having a business of your own? Like one thing I've seen, uh, I've seen that is full of potential in this country now or worldwide is renewable energy. Renewable energy, reducing carbon footprint. And you're talking about we we our country our uh, 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 ourselves, uh, you know we're talking about uh, if if my memory serves me well, we are aspiring to generate like eighteen thousand megawatts of uh, electricity coming from renewable renewable energy sources, especially solar power, uh, in another ten years or so if I remember it correctly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then today we are only uh, at a fraction, about eight percent only. So there's still a, lo a lot of room to grow. So we talk about digital financial inclusion. Let's not forget about other, uh, you know, 
how to use that productivity. Thank you. Thanks. I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, so I think digital is going to be inevitable. So whatever you do, you may work for a private sector company, you may work for a, a, a government or a regulator. I think three things to keep in mind as you pursue your professional endeavors is be responsible, uh, be fair, and be inclusive. So these three things uh, cut across irrespective of your professional uh, endeavors, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are there any questions coming from the floor? Um, perhaps you could raise your hands and we will pick a few. Um, there are also questions from the audience attending online as well. So I'll just scroll through and pick them out. But let's take um, questions from the floor first. Anyone? Um, seeing as there's none, we'll go with a question here um, that we have. Digital finance services are expected to help vulnerable communities, households, and SMEs in making smarter decisions and utilizing financial services to simplify consumption and savings. Digital finance created new possibilities, but also changed the dimension of risk. In the Malaysian context, do communities, households, and SMEs reap the benefits of digital financial abilities in terms of guaranteeing economic stability and a sustainable future. So to put it simply, has digital finance benefited people? Well, I certainly like to think so. No, I wouldn't be up here, right? So I would like to think that, you know, we've done about almost like... Uh, four or five billion ringgit worth of flows to the books. Um, and every cent of that's gone through our books basically is a cent saved compared to the banks, no offense. <laughs> but generally speaking, I think that um, all of us fintechs out there, e-wallets and out there, uh, e-wallets are a more, more larger uh, perspective, I guess. Uh, long story short, yes, but actually not that impactful just yet. I would say we're barely scratching the surface of two, three, four percent kind of level of the kind of effect that we would need to see ultimately, not just by money match, but by all the major fintechs per se. The banks also, as I mentioned, CIMB owns touch and go, right? So the same top percent as well, maybe back to the MAE as well. Uh, the banks also are very involved in the space as well. They have their own specific channels, whether it's the MAE, touch and go, so on and so forth as well. So it's not just all oh, fintechs and killing the banks. Uh, the banks also have certain divisions between themselves that handle these kind of things as well. Um, so it's all great and fantastic. The budget has been set out. And yet, end of the day, still people are still using cash here and there for the majority of times people you know buzz the pandemic over don't care as much for qr as they used to per se out of the urban areas so it hasn't been enough impact and that can only be changed over time to more financial literacy government uh, uh, programs as well and also hopefully more and more of us fintechs and all that getting into the market uh, and spreading it out there so yes but not impactful enough yet i, I just like to add on that potential reason why the impact has not you know, being felt that much. Uh, it goes back to behavioral study. So you talk about culture. So I had the chance of uh, applying behavioral study when I did my PhD about, uh, you know, some sort of uh, psychological theory in terms of why people adopt technology. So one, uh, there are five things that normally we talk about uh, behavioral study on technology adoption. One is about the ease of use. The tool must be very easy to use. Second is about social norms. You know, it's about your peers, whether your peers are pushing you to adopt or not to adopt. And third is about facilitating conditions. And facilitating conditions talk about whether it is safe behaviorally. If they think it's not safe, then they wouldn't actually adopt that. So this is where, you know, that security, digital security, data security is very important. And the uh, regulators need to put a proper framework around it. So that, I think, potentially can assist to spur more adoption is about trust. So trust is very important. You know, for example, if I, I once, when I give a talk, I said to that, if you touch the computer, if it doesn't explode, can you trust the computer? They say yes. If it's, it's exploding and there's sound, they won't touch it. So trust is very important and that's where all the uh, regulations to ensure trust. 
That's great. Yeah. So I think um, one thing that I've uh, recently attended a session on, they say that new technology, especially financial technology, will likely occur in developing markets or the rest of the developed world. And the reason for that is human habits. So in, in many markets where credit cards are normal, it, they know that the phone is there, they know that QR is there, and it's probably a better experience to pay via it but they are just so used to taking a piece of plastic from their, from their wallet and tapping it when they pay for something that they forget that there's an alternative that there is there. So perhaps we just love our paper money a bit too much <laughs> to change to something else. Um, are there questions from the floor? Ah, there's one over there and then maybe we can go for the next one. So we'll start with that guy there. Uh, so I think my question will be quite simple. So like now we come, uh, financing become more digital and more social, like we, more people have access to it. Do you think some of the service like um, PE, VC or investment banking, do you think like in the future there will be less demand for them and more demand to the retail investing like P2P or crowdfunding? I think I know who I guess I've answered that since I'm the co-founder of Pitching Equity Crowd Funding. But yeah, so uh, so yeah, uh, hopefully so. I'm actually the chief founding uh, uh, operating officer for Pitching uh, Equity Crowd Funding as well back then in the day. So very, very big believer in equity crowd funding as well to, to digitalize and that could, that could, uh, democratize the way that people do finance. So long story short, uh, yes and no. I don't think you will see, PE and VC is really quite different, I would say, in terms of the world uh, that they look into, say. And even in terms of like PE per se, they still look into like, PE can take over fintechs and, and like bring it up from net mar next markets and all that. So it's still private equity and venture capital is still very much by itself. Uh, but touching upon equity crowdfunding and debt crowdfunding as well and P2P, we definitely see that as a new way very much. So alternative financing, very thankful the Securities Commission of Malaysia has been very, very uh, pro for this as well. And it's actually been proven a very legitimate way for new businesses, small businesses to actually get their start out there. You can even choose conventional, you can even choose Islamic as well. Uh, so definitely without a doubt. Um, and I think that very much so that if you're in the know, you're in the space and you can go out there and attend these kind of events, equity crowdfunding uh, campaign events, understand how it works out. You yourself one day can go out there, do a small race of 100 to 100,000 ringgit and start your own business as well. I've seen guys starting up business for opening board game shops as well. A uh, raise 50,000 ringgit to open a bunch of friends, open up a, a board game cafe shop. Also can be done. But in the past, no such thing. But now equity crowdfunding, debt crowdfunding actually gives you the chance to do this kind of small, small things also. So I would like to think, yes, um, it's still not out there very much in the rural side uh, and the suburban side, unfortunately. It's still very much a clang rally thing at the moment, uh, but do take that advantage and look up to these kind of new opportunities. Uh, maybe I'll quickly come in here. I think uh, there, there is uh, space uh, for, for more players to come in. So, but what, what may happen is this will create a healthy competition within the ecosystem and we'll see those uh, exorbitant fund-based income, fee-based income for investment banking and other private equity placements and all going down, which is in the benefit of the consumer at the end of the day by creating healthy competition, I guess. So there is a space for all the players and all types of products to be offered, I guess. Thank you. That's great. I actually, I actually have a, I've tried out Pitched In before. Yeah, it's quite friendly. Um, I recommend people to check it out. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think there's one more question, right? Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, panelists, so much for the session just now. So my question uh, to all the panelists is, in terms of financial inclusion for SMEs in Malaysia, where do you hope to see Malaysia in 10 years' time? Big question. <laughs> I think I, I, what I would like to see is that this, uh, according to uh, certain statistics, uh, would mention the source. Uh, I think out of the so many, let's take, let me take this example. Um, there are two over million of, uh, uh, 20 over million of working adults. And uh, there are only about 40 over percent of them have some form of uh, borrowing, okay, uh, with at least a credit card. So there's still a lot of space, a lot of room. Either they, uh, they don't want to borrow by choice or they are having some kind of problem with their records to get access to any sort of fun thing. So then I've been reading about this uh, because sometimes I also feel threatened, right? Because of you know, digital banking and then what will happen to my sort of uh, conventional banking. 
uh, especially my brother here sitting next to me. Uh, the thing here is that uh, I, I think you see, you see, existing banks, existing banks, they already have that. They already have the license, uh, uh, um, um, the so the, the so called licensing. Um, uh, um, uh, I will say the 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 opportunity to get into digital banking. So we are already doing that. Like you see CMB Bank, you see the Octo, the very cute uh, Octo um, things like that. So then um, I think perhaps we can bring in something. If you ask me what I would like to see is that uh, perhaps the alternate, uh, alternative credit scoring, alternative credit scoring. I think this one will make very good sense because yeah, I think so much we want to teach the uh, SMEs, especially the micro about financial literacy, having your audited reports prepared well, having your bank statements uh, 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 looking beautifully uh, in order to suit the bank's requirements. Why not we explore some other form of uh, credit scoring? Like for example, I mentioned about that, uh, psychometric, you know, psychometric, hmm? is it something like a meta science or some sort? No, actually, uh, you know, you, you look to the Chinese tradition, we've been using it for thousands of years, you know, we can tell your characters by looking at your face, right? And then we have new technologies coming, like for example, facial recognition, you know, and then we'll, that will help with the psychometric, uh, you know, some answers for, uh, some questions for you to answer in order to tell your, uh, your, your characteristics, you know? And also, uh, I think lately, uh, we can also tell by looking at your movement, your posture, right? So I hope all these technologies uh, can actually help us together, uh, digital, either digital or, or traditional banks, uh, with this kind of advancements in technology uh, that we can have actually more and more, um, um, you know, solid basis, uh, reliable basis, reliable algorithm uh, in order to give some kind of funding apart. But, you know, to give them funding, to give them the access to finance is one thing. It's the job is not done yet. The duty is not done yet. They need to know how to spend the money. They need to have a solid business plan. And it's not just about pumping money in and then hopefully you can generate profit day in, day out, doing it on a BAU basis, living on or sustaining on borrowing. That is not going to work, right? So then access to financing, yes, that is very important. Everyone must be included in that eco uh, ecosystem. But the other hand is that you must know what you do. You must have certain, uh, you know, this is a very good example, money match, right? So then uh, now they can command a lot of uh, funding, doesn't matter, uh, uh, because they know what they do. They have a business, a very solid business plan, a very solid business strategy. I think both uh, should, not be, uh, should not be separated. Both should be looked at together. Thank you. I mean, that's a good answer, right? I think and it interconnects with what we just heard this morning that, you know, one day, there won't be digital banking because all banks are going to be digital. So there's no separation of the two. There will be some convergence at some point later on. And then the other part is to don't assess a person just based on one factor alone, right? You should assess it and in its entirety. And, and because you are assessing someone, there's always this question of biasness. How do you avoid that biasness and not give an unfair judgment? I think it applies to people. It also applies to companies as well. Right? If you use the wrong valuation method, you undervalue a company, nobody's going to be happy. You overvalue a company, you end up wasting money. So um, there's a bit of science and a bit of art that's there. Um, are there any questions from the floor? If there's none, I think we can wrap up. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Since that's a bit of time. Yeah. So uh, just to add more about your question, how do we see ourselves in the next 10 years? So I think uh, a few, three things, which I think is very important. First is about uh, continuous improvement or continuous innovation. Because, you know, digital space, it keeps changing. And we've seen that probably uh, those earlier adopters, like two years ago, if they're not... Uh, actually innovating and they're not uh, improving, then they will be uh, left behind. So continu continuous and constant innovation is actually very important. Uh, secondly is the resilience. Yeah, it has to be, you know, business need to be resilient. You need to build a proper controls, a proper management so that you know what is going on in your business and you are navigating it well. And third is agility. 
and you know the your the agility covers your staffing you know the staff has to continuously learn and you have to be agile whatever new things that your competitors are coming out you know how to handle that so agility is very important so the, i think these are the three things that's important for uh, the current business and new business that's coming to chart themselves for the next 10 years that's great um so perhaps to just, add oh, a yeah, bit more. Let's, let's go on yeah yeah, um, so at uh, my office, so we are brainstorming, we have been brainstorming on to, uh, to develop a program to train the SME, uh, uh, to train the SMEs. So then, yeah, you give them financing, we were talking about financing, right? And then uh, what about, you know, international, regional or, 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 or national policies? Like, for example, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, what that will bring us? Competition? opportunities, threats. Okay, what do we have? You know, should we look, should we just uh, wait and see? No, immediate action has to be taken because uh, under this uh, RCEP, this Regional Economic Partnership uh, among 15 countries, uh, where you'll be seeing something like a Eurozone, where goods and people will be free to move around, right? So then as a businessman, what do you need to do now? What do you need to prepare yourself now? You can give you, uh, because bearing in mind free movement, meaning to say you can go out, people can also come into our country. So the competition is going to be tough. So then what do you need to do now? Uh, well, you start, you need, really need to start into, uh, to look into your business model. Uh, you know, because financing is only just really one small part. So ultimately is how do you operate effectively, cost efficiently, you know, by using technology, by living on technology. So now those days, people are talking about accountants, you know, preparing tons of invoices and documents, you know, to prepare for an audit. Today, we're talking about cloud accounting, where you just scan and then the cloud will do the bookkeeping for you. And then at the end, the data or the images will be given, because I think it's allowed by law, soft copies, you know, uh, will be just, you know, just uh, 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 the, your accountant can then access the cloud, the data that's held uh, on the cloud in order to prepare your management accounts, everything. So that's one part of it. How to, um, you know, how to uh, have a more efficient business model. And another thing I mentioned just now, agriculture, just take an example, by using IoT, increasing your product, and therefore your production cost will come down. Your production cost will come down and there in your competitiveness, right? So then uh, been talking to SMEs, like if you say electricity, 1%, you save. Water, if you cut the wastage, another one percent. And I have a friend rest I have a friend operating a chain of restaurants, and then every day before he closed his shop, he will inspect the rubbish bin. He will inspect the rubbish bin. Why? It should not have any unnecessary wastage because that can account for another one or two percent. So contact collectively, four percent already. So what about other things? Your laundry, your employees, and things like that. So then there goes your margin if you don't pay attention to all this. So then all in, we are, talking, we are talking about entrepreneurship. How do you manage your business? How do you sell the same thing at a lower cost? So your pricing strategy, a lot of things. So going back to the gentleman just now, in the next 10 years, I'm a, my vision is to train up all these SMEs for them to be more successful because the same thing, they grow, we grow together collectively. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll, maybe I'll I'll make it make it more generic. I I think uh, digital will enable advancement of SMEs in, on three fronts. Actually, uh, first is on information. Information could be about uh, price discovery, so effective price uh, discovery for the benefit of the SMEs as well as for the consumers. Right. Information could also translate to data about the consumer in order to offer. Um, the uh, customized products to customized uh, segments. So in uh, data could uh, does not necessarily mean more data, but data could translate to effective data, data that is uh, necessarily required to deliver products and services. The second aspect is related to access to markets. So currently, um, many of the SMEs may be catering to uh, the region they're uh, based in, but going forward, that is going to expand 
with the, the digitalization and platformization of uh, businesses. And third is uh, finance, access to finance, right? So currently, uh, most of the SMEs, uh, they are not, uh, th there's a huge credit gap as well as broader finance gap, right? So in the last, in the next five to 10 years, we'll see more sophisticated uh, products, finance, um, it could be credit savings payment products coming in and playing a bigger role in digitizing the financial ecosystem of SMEs actually on three fronts. Thank you. Thank you very much. So to wrap up, um, maybe I'll put three things. Uh, number one is financial education, right? This applies to both individuals and SMEs as well. So um, here, information is power. The more you know, the better it is and you can take advantage of what's coming up. The other part is being prepared prepared for different things that may come your way and always plan a little bit in the future. This is where you might need to watch your margins as Paul pointed out. Then the second thing would be to embrace technology. So there are a lot of new opportunities that may come as, um, as for example, what Nathan has pointed out, or Gias has pointed out, and even Dr. Noah right, has pointed out. And finally, there's this need of, of regulation that's there. There are a lot of promises that are being made how do we know which one is real and which one is false? Um, this is something that we probably need to wade through together because it's a fast moving industry. So things are moving really quickly. And we, I guess we only know when we actually get there, we'll cross the bridge then. Um, thank you very much for today's session. It's a fruitful session. Um, I think many of them are on LinkedIn. So you can search them up to keep in touch. Um, their names are here. So that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan and our panelists for the eye-opening session. So please remain on stage as we award the certificate of appreciation for the end of photo session as well. Let's invite our deputy organizing chairperson, Dinesh, to deliver a certificate to all of our speakers on stage as a token of appreciation. Our first panelist, Dr. Numazila. Thank you. Our second panelist will be Mr. Nason. Moving on, our third panelist will be Mr. Paul Liang Chi Pong. Next panelist will be Mr. Jiazuddin. Last but not least, we have our wonderful moderator for our second panel session, Mr. Jonathan. All right, um, thank you everyone. So uh, let's stand up in front there, have a photo session, all right? Thank you to all of our second panel session and all of the speakers and moderator. Please, please have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, next, we would like to invite you, Tan Sri Michael Yo, 
to deliver the closing keynotes for AMU Economic Summit 2022, Malaysia Disrupted Inclusivity in Digital Economy. Tan Sri Michael Yeo is the president at the KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, previously the co-founder and CEO of the Asian Strategy and Leadership Institute, and also the deputy chairman of the Economics Club of Kuala Lumpur. He is a renowned public intellectual, social entrepreneur, author, and intellectual international speakers. Having represented Malaysia on, inter on the international stage and held multiple important positions in various distinguished or organizations, Tan Sri Michael Yeo is a man of many achievements. He has authored five books and has spoken at a forum organized by the World Economic Forum, Conference of Indian Industry, Center of China and Globalization, the Asia Society, the China Development Institute, the World Policy Conference, Oxford and Cambridge University. He holds a degree in economics from Monash University and a doctor of law from the University of Nottingham. He has also attended senior management courses at Wharton School and Harvard Business School. Everyone, please welcome Tan Sri Michael Yeo. Very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for that introduction. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to participate once again at the AMU Economic Summit. If I remember correctly, I spoke at your first AMEU Economic Summit. That must be like six, seven years ago or, or even longer. I can't quite uh, remember. Uh, so it's delighted to be back here again to share some thoughts with all of you, you had a very interesting panel just now. I had the opportunity of sitting in to hear some of the views and the suggestions shared. So I would not be long in my closing remarks just to highlight some key strategic issues that perhaps the country needs to look at in making the digital journey ahead of us. Malaysia needs to undertake major reforms and transformation to achieve the full potential of the dig digital economy. And that requires a very strong focus on what I would consider the three T's, technology, talent, and trust. And this also was a three T's that came up very strongly when in June, this year, my organization organized the first World Digital Economy and Technology Summit. And it is the conclusion that going forward, any country that wants to embark on its digital journey without embracing the three T's of technology, talent, and trust will find the journey ahead very difficult and challenging. Our economic potential will be driven by what I would look at as the future key economic drivers. And that will include the digital economy. It will include the green technology and green economy going forward with a greater emphasis on renewable energy and climate action. It will also focus also on the electronic and engineering industries that Malaysia is strong in, as well as on our resource-based industries. Digitalization has impacted on and will continue to impact on our lives, our business, and our country. In Japan, the progress of digital transformation has now led to Japan embracing and transforming what they now call Society 5.0. And this is interesting because we are yet to even achieve Industry 4.0 here in Malaysia. And that shows the huge gap that we still have when we com are compared to end benchmark against major developed countries like Japan, USA, and China. Hence, we need to be able to scale up very quickly our knowledge, our expertise, our skills, 
in AI, artificial intelligence and blockchain in augmented reality and the internet of things that will be the future drivers of digital growth worldwide. And with an increasingly VUCA world that we live in, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world, the VUCA world, we need to be able to address in the immediate short term, two major economic crises the world is currently facing. The two eyes crisis, inflation and interest rates. There is also a greater focus on countries embarking on the central bank digital currency, like the digital yuan that is now practiced and implemented in China. More countries will likely to adopt digital currencies going forward. And these will bring a whole lot of challenges for many of our countries and industries and businesses. Being adaptable to change, being adaptable to embrace these new technologies is key for us to succeed. As such, our graduates of all disciplines needs to be future ready. You need to be prepared for the future world and be able to future proof yourself. Technology changes so fast. We need to keep abreast of the new trends and challenges that we need to face and address going forward. We need to be able to upgrade our own skills, our thinking and embrace the future competitive world that we are facing right now. We cannot stop learning because knowledge has no end. The need to reskill will continue to be a key imperative and an urgent need for all of us. Let me just share some data that I thought could be useful to bear in mind. According to a publication, E-Economy Southeast Asia, a 2021 report by Google, it was also jointly authored by Tamase and Bain and Company, a leading consulting firm. Malaysia's digital economy is expected to grow to US $35 billion in gross merchandise value by 2025. Malaysia leads the region with 88% or 22 million of our population being di digital consumers. At the moment, the digital economy contributes to 22.6% of Malaysia's GDP and will continue to grow to 25.5% of our GDP and create 500,000 jobs by 2025. As we all know, the Malaysian government has recently launched the Malaysian Digital Economy Blueprint, My Digital, to make Malaysia a high-tech nation by 2030. It is very lucrative, therefore, for young people like all of you to be able to develop and enhance multiple skills. Just one skill alone is not sufficient. You need to be multi-skilled to develop multiple skills so that you can be future ready and future proof yourself for the jobs of the future. The digital revolution in Malaysia is already underway. Right now, 890,000 Malaysian SMEs have adopted e-commerce by 2021. There are 3,000 technology startups in the country right now. Three startup unicorns, Carsum, Air Asia Digital, and Edotco Group have been shown to be success stories here in Malaysia. Malaysia's internet penetration is close to 80% of the population and access to smartphones is extremely high. I think there are more smartphones in the country than there are a number of people in our country as well. However, according to the UN's International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, only 80% of Malaysians have 
standard ICT skills. Many of them are young people like all of you, despite the generalization that Gen Y and Z are digital native. This needs to grow and to be improved upon. What should be done, therefore, to future-proof our younger generation? We need to have public, private, and people partnerships that will be able to look at one, accelerate the teaching of digital skills and new modules in schools and, and universities, two, to promote digital consumers' tools to equip them to use digital payments and e-commerce. We've heard a lot in the last session earlier. Three, to build digital infrastructure. Example, the 5G, the uh, fast fiber optics, mobile broadband, and, and to enhance internet access to the rural communities because digital inclusion is a key challenge that we need to address. Fourth, to mainstream science, technology, and innovation so that all sectors of society are able to benefit. And fifth, to develop and foster healthy digital entrepreneurial ecosystem through collaboration between universities, government, entrepreneurs, industry, and civil society. And I think these are the five major challenges we need to embrace going forward as a nation. I think we need to be able to ensure that the education system here is reformed and reformed very quickly so that we are able to come up with a new cohort of digital natives that can embrace the digital economy almost immediately. I believe that to be successful in the digital economy, you need to perhaps adopt a three-piece framework. First P being prepare to make adequate preparation for the digital economy, identify the gaps and how to close these gaps. The second P is planning, where you need to make detailed plans of the resources you need and how you will implement and execute your plan. Third P is promote. How do you promote your organization and your products and services through the digital space? Digitalization, I believe, must also support the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs of the UN. We need to use digital technology to advance sustainability and inclusivity. Digitalization, at the end of it all, must benefit all Malaysians, and we must leave no one behind. If we don't help others digitalize, we will be the only ones with digital skills, and others won't enjoy the benefits of digitalization. And hence, together as a country, together between government, business, civil society, we need to work together to embrace the various strategies and plans that we have to make us successful as a digital economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tantri, for the wonderful uh, closing keynote just now. Now I would like to invite uh, E.V. Lim to deliver a certificate to Tan Sri Michael Yo as a token of appreciation. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Now, to close today's summit, 
we would like to invite the deputy organizing chairperson, Dinesh, to deliver the closing remark. Please welcome everyone, Dinesh. Thank you, Hollis. A very good evening to our speakers, VIPs, and participants. I am Dinesh Kumar Tanasegran, and I am the Deputy Organizing Chairperson of this year's summit. Once again, I would like to thank our venue sponsor, Sunway, our monetary sponsors, Silver Lake PWC Project 57, and our in-kind sponsor, My Burger Lab, for allowing us to hold this event. From our first panel, we learned how data can be used to benefit government policymaking and MSME businesses and how this data ecosystem can be improved to further empower these policymakers and businesses. From our second panel, we learned how digital innovation can benefit our SMEs and our B40 community. I believe that this summit has achieved its goal, which was to explore the benefits of today's digital transformation for Malaysia's formulation businesses, the government, and ultimately our rakyat. I am thrilled to see what other changes this transformation has to offer in the future. However, saying this, we should not forget about our underprivileged communities as the summit also aims to empower more people to partake in this digital age while leaving no one behind. Thank you to our participants, both physical and online, for attending this event. Do remember that there are interactive sessions tomorrow to better prepare yourselves for, the, for this digital age. Lastly, a special shout out to our organizing committee who has spent their time, effort, and also are currently sleep deprived to help make this event possible. I do not wish to take up your time any further. Thank you all for attending this event. And then it's Merdeka month. I would like to wish you all Selamat Hari Merdeka in advance. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dinesh, for the closing remark.